I'm Chad Main, the founder of legal services company Percipient, and this is Technically Legal, a podcast about legal technology and innovation in the legal industry. Today's episode, we talk to Greg Lambert. He's the chief knowledge services officer for the Dallas-based law firm of Jackson Walker. Greg Lambert is a fellow podcaster, and he's also a legal blogger. He and Marlene Gebauer host the Geek and Review podcast, and Greg also writes for the Three Geeks in the Law blog. Both the podcast and the blog focus on legal innovation. But Greg's day job is Chief Knowledge Services Officer for the Dallas-based law firm of Jackson Walker. Although Greg still considers himself a law librarian, as we will hear, the role of the law librarian in the 2020s is way different than it was in the late 90s, when Greg started after a stint in the Army and with a master's degree and a law degree in hand. If the term law library encounters up visions of books and old school car catalogs, I encourage you to think again. As we will hear, in Greg's current position, Greg oversees several non-library related functions that involve the use of tech and data. Greg is a member of the firm's C-suite and is not only in charge of the firm's library, but also its research team, its conflicts team, its intake team. He also helps out with law firm marketing and business development. Greg and I caught up late last year via Zoom, where he was sitting comfortably in the living room at 11222 Dilling Street the home of Carol and Mike Brady. Is that the... Yeah. Are you at the Brady house? <laughs> I, am. I am. That was my first background uh, back in March, and I've just stuck with it. it well, you, you didn't tell me you were coming live and direct from the Bradys. Right right there. Uh, yeah, you'll see Marsha running through, holding her nose after we hit her in the face with the football. So. Okay, Marsha. Okay. <laughs> oh, man. The, the other day I was listening to your podcast. Uh, the Geek and Review. Which, which one? I love the name, by the way. The Geek and Review. I love the name. And the reason I, I've been wanting to get you on the podcast for a while, but the reason that I got motivated to do so and reached out to you is because you had that theme music. Your but it's your buddy, right? And I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. his name right. Jerry yeah, David yeah. DeChica. DeSica. DeSica. So, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, so Jerry and I we go back not not a long. I think it's about seven years or so. Um, but actually, his partner, um, Eve, is my research attorney in San Antonio. So we met through her. And I always laugh because Eve was, Eve's also a a musician. She's actually, she was in a band called uh, Bird and Flower um, from uh, Columbus, Ohio. And, uh, you know, when I was interviewed, well, when I, when I got her resume, I did, you know, I just went out on Google and kind of did a search and immediately found, you know, the band and, and she had like a video and it was, you know, it was pretty, uh, Americana music. And so I always tease her that, you know, I said, I, I really hired you because you're a great musician. <laughs> we always need a good, good musician around here. So, um, how did the theme yeah. music come about? Did you commission it or how, how did that work? Yeah. Well, I just, I just asked Jerry if, if it was okay to use it. And he sent me the, the way files without the, uh, vocals on it. And, um, you know, and I told him, I said, you know, we'll make sure that, that, every, you know, every episode we have a link out. And, um, and so he's put out a new record. I saw too. He put out a new yeah, record the last month. Yeah. I, yep, I was listening to his yeah. stuff. He's definitely got that Texas sound. He's definitely got that. Yeah. Texas which sound. is interesting. Cause he's from Columbus, Ohio. Oh, so really? He's only, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was in a band for years called, uh, the black swans, um, out of Ohio. And it was, it was funny cause I was at a local, um, record store here in Houston and I came across a CD of the black swans. And so I just grabbed it, you know, it was like, three bucks in the, in the, uh, uh, discount aisle and, or used aisle. And I went up and, and went to pay for it. And the, the cashier was like, Oh dude, you're going to love this. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, all right. So I was like texting Jerry at the same time and said, well, you got, you got high praise here from the, the guy behind the counter. So <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah. I, I definitely heard that Texas. I heard some, not, not every song, yeah. but there's definitely some old 97s about it. It yeah. was, it was, yep. it was good stuff. It was, it yeah, was good yeah. stuff. And and the uh the song at, at the end, uh, Devil's Backbone Bar, there's a road uh um out in um uh was it uh Blanc- Blanco, Texas or something like that, that's called the Devil's Backbone Road. And there's you know bars around there. There's actually a a, a, a brewery um out in uh, called Real Real Ale Brewery out there and they have a devil's backbone beer and uh, so I, I, we'll, we'll drink that as well sorry i'm i i will ramble here so no no that's, you know, that's, that's no tight. i was excited to, i was excited to have this conversation <laughs> because then we were talking you sent me a picture 
you've got that Telecaster, the Lone Star yeah. Telecaster. So you, do you play much? I, uh, my, the way that I put my playing is I'm not, I'm not very good, but I'm really loud. And so that make up for it. Volume, uh, <laughs> volume. That's, hey, that's part of the. And, and I actually got that from my uncle, who's a Pentecostal preacher. And he, and he uh, it told me one time, he's like, you know, uh, sometimes when you're, when you're not really confident in what you're talking about, you just say it really loud and, <laughs> and sincere and, you know, and, and people just, just buy into it. <laughs> which is not only, which is not only good advice for musicians, but for legal too. There's a, you Absolutely. Know, we all know that that, yep. he who speaks loudest. Yeah. It, as little as you know, you probably know more than the guy you're talking to. So <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, <laughs> use that cool. to your advantage. <laughs> uh, I saw you're in the army. How long were you in the army? What were you doing there? Yeah, I did. Uh, I did a four year stint that ended up being like a four year and four month stint um, because I was uh, in during the late eighties, early nineties, and uh, so I got out and started school in in nineteen ninety. And then my second semester, uh, Desert Storm broke out, and I got a nice little telegram from uh, President uh, and you know, George H. W. Bush saying, "Hey, welcome back." <laughs> and uh, so I had to take a semester off. Um, ended up actually just going up to uh, uh, Fort Lewis in Washington State, and we were we were supposed to be the second wave, but once they decided not to go into uh, Baghdad um, that time, uh, it was over. And so we spent about four, you know, uh, I'd say about eight, eight to 10 weeks that we spent there. And then like one day they're like, all right, pack up all your stuff. You're going home. And, uh, and then I went back to college. And then also <laughs> you do get a, you get a JD. You, you do, you do go to law school, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I did, uh, something interesting, um, in that I did my law degree and my master's in library science at the same time. Um, it, they didn't have a dual degree at the University of Oklahoma, but uh, so I had to kind of take both of the the courses at the same time. And I kind of, uh, uh, you know, lied a little bit to the library school and, and got through uh, a number of courses that I probably shouldn't have taken that, at, you know, simultaneously as taking law school classes. But uh, um, they they didn't uh, check their records and I didn't say anything. So uh, uh you know, and made it, made it through, made it through. What was the, what was your desire? I mean, obviously, you know, you get a law degree and oftentimes you want to be a lawyer, but what was the dual interest in libraries? Yeah. And, and, and well, my wife, I think nails it. Uh, she's, she's a librarian as well. And, and really the, the idea I was, I was working at the main library at the university of Oklahoma um, while I was going through uh, law school. I was a, a programmer. I was the billing uh, supervisor. I did all kinds of jobs uh, there. And my wife constantly reminds me, it's like, you, you know, you, you're not a lawyer with a law de- with a library degree. You're a librarian with a law degree. Um, and, and that's really kind of the whole, the whole idea was I, I was not going to practice. Um, I was going to work uh, law library, you know, initially I thought it was going to be in academic because, you know, that's all I knew at the time. But, uh, in, uh, 2002, when I, when I moved down to Houston, I, uh, was, was working a, uh, consulting for a project where we were re- rebuilding the university of Houston's law library, which flooded during tropical storm Allison in 01. Um, but in 04, when that, when I kind of wrapped up that project, I went to go work with King and Spalding and that was my first, um, you know, work with the law firm. And that was, that's where I found my home. Uh, the law firms are just to, for me, it was just the perfect fit. And what was it about that, that you liked better than academia? Um, well, in academia, there's, there's kind of a cycle, uh, I think. And so, you know, you know, you're going to be doing X during the fall semester. You're going to be doing Y during the spring semester. During the summer, you're going to be be doing you know, this other project. And and it's not to say it's the same thing over and over again, but there's a consistency there. Um, in the law firm, um, especially, you know, I was working with King and Spalding. You know, there's multiple practice groups. Uh, I was in the Houston office, in the main offices in Atlanta, and, you know, I'd, I'd wake up in, in the morning and, you know, an, answer some questions about litigation and then work with some uh, vendors in the afternoon and then do some real estate. Uh, you know, so it was a variety uh, of work. 
Um, and it was, you know, and it was immediate. We needed, it, it wasn't something that was like, okay, you're going to have, you know, uh, two weeks to, to do this, or, you know, you're going to have to present at this class next week. It was like, I got to have this right now. So. And I, and I think I saw too, you worked with the state of Oklahoma, right? You were helping them compile their statutes. What, where, where did yeah, that come in? That was, that, I always say that, that was uh, the, my most favorite job that paid the least. Um, which is, I think a, a lot of people run into that. Um, yeah, what we did uh, was we actually compiled and put online uh, the entire uh, catalog of the courts, the appellate courts decisions. Um, we used the vendor neutral citation system for it, which was just basically numbering the paragraphs. And there was a certain um, uh, path that you use to um, to put as a main citation because it's not in a book, it's online only. Um, and the uh, state Supreme Court there actually used that vendor neutral citation as the official citation. So if you cited to a case uh, that was decided after May 1st, 1997, you had to use that. Um, so we, we became integrated in, into the court and it was just it was just fun. I mean, this was the late '90s, early 2000s. You know, during the dot com boom, and you know, we were. Uh, I and, and in fact, I still say that's that's the best state court site uh, in in the U.S. And uh, when when I left, we were uh, had worked on getting all of the dockets, a uniform docket system, kind of like Pacer, but for the state and free. Um, and so we were, uh, you know, you'd never think of Oklahoma as being a super right. progressive state as far as, uh, you know, getting information out there, but they really were. Um, and, and so we, we had a lot of fun. Um, and uh, like I said, it was one, one, it may have been my, my favorite job. Wow. That's what, what year did you wrap that up? Oh, I got out of there in 02 when I moved down to, uh, to, to Houston. Um, but by the time I had finished, we had put all of the uh, court uh, the court decisions online. And at that point, we were maintaining that and then fo really focused on uh, getting the dockets uh, going. Since you started doing the library related stuff in the 90s, um, and now we're in 2020 now, you've you've seen the full gamut. Like when I was just got out of law school, was still practicing, the library was just what you think it was, you know, books and you went on in your you know, Northwestern <laughs> digest and looking for the, for the key, right key to yeah. find the right case <laughs> and all that. But so you've seen some changes, but your current title is chief knowledge services officer. So give me the day in the life. What, what's your responsibility there at the firm? What are you, what are you in charge of? Yeah. So at, at Jackson Walker, I've got a number of departments that, that I oversee. So um, obviously C level. So I'm on the senior management staff for the, for the firm. Um, there's, I think, uh, seven other, or, you know, seven of us that are on the senior management staff, roughly. And uh, I oversee the library, our research team, uh, conflicts and intake. And then we also are, uh, I've got people that handle our RFP uh, responses and uh, create the pitch materials. So we work uh, really in, in coordination with our marketing and business development team. And one of the nice things about that is we've kind of split it into uh, different areas in that if it's, if it's research due diligence type work, then that really should be handled by the researchers. If it's actually working, uh, getting the, the attorneys uh, focused on their business development and presenting to the uh, to the clients or potential clients, then that's a marketing biz dev section. So it works out really nicely. And uh, you know, I've always, it, and when I was at King Spalding, when I'm at Jackson Walker, I've always had a real tight relationship with with the marketing team, and um, I've I've always been there to say, look, you know. We need to play to our strengths, um, and luckily, I've I've had really good you know CMOS and and uh, business development officers that that I've worked with that have bought into that, and, and so I think it it plays to all of our strengths. It's it's interesting because you know like, you know going back to the old school, what, you know I remember a library to be the librarian was just down there with the books, and you you know if the book yeah. wasn't there, she'd go find it. But you've got 
especially nowadays, you've got many other responsibilities and it's not just finding the books, which obviously are, it's not books anymore. But when you were hired there at Jackson Walker, was it this position or were you hired straight up as a librarian? No, I was hired to, to run the, run the departments. Um, uh, it was interesting because a couple of, uh, I'm trying to think I started in 2012 here. And I think within two or three years, we moved from the Bank of America building in downtown uh, Dallas. And if you ever see a, a picture of downtown Dallas, it's the one that's out, that's real tall, that's outlined in a yeah, green, green neon. Yeah. So uh, we, we moved from that into a new building and we really shrunk the amount of space that we had. Um, and it was it was absolutely ridiculous, the amount of space that the library held in the in the old building. And, uh, and when we moved it over, we decided that what we were going to do was because, you know, it, it's not that we didn't use books. It's just that we didn't need all of the books that we had, had you know, collected over 30 years of being in that building. And so we just embedded the books into basically the hallways that were in next to the practice groups. Um, and that was a conscious decision. And uh, I will tell you that uh, there were there were a number of attorneys that were not happy uh, to do that. But once we got over there and they saw, the, you know, how easy it was to, uh, you know, just get outside their office and, you know, walk 15 steps. And there you were rather than having to. And, and I don't know if you know this. Lawyers don't get off their floor. Uh, very rarely do they go I'm from aware. one floor to another. And so once they realized, you know, that uh, um, you know, materials that they really needed were were within, you know, a few walk, uh, walking paces of getting it. Um, and that also gave us an opportunity to say, OK, you know, all this other stuff that we're paying thousands of dollars for that are online that you're refusing to use. Now's the time to, to come to grips on on how to use that. So it, it was really kind of a good, good you know, it was good. Uh, opportunity for for keeping the materials that needed to be in print and then educating them on the materials that were were accessible online. Do you still have print materials there at the firm? Are they still being yeah. used? Or? Yeah, when we'll, and that's the thing about it is we'll always have print materials because, uh, quite frankly, because of the cost. Um, it's a lot cheaper for some materials to have them in print because only one person uses that than to buy an online version of that, which may only be sold as a, you know, well, you got to buy it for everybody in that practice, or you got to buy it for the whole firm. Um, so, you know, you can buy a $200 book or you can buy a $5,000 subscription. And so, you know, that's, that's why, that's why I get paid the big bucks is to make those decisions. <laughs> and that's, that's interesting. I, I never would have thought of that. I never would have thought of it because everything you would think, yeah. well, it's on a server somewhere and it's not taking up physical shelf space. That's cheaper. So that's a, that's very interesting. Online is never cheaper. I will, I will tell you that. Describe the difference between your role at King and Spalding versus the, the, the role you have now at Jackson Walker. Yeah, the, the well, one, uh, you know, it's, it's different level. I was a manager at King and Spalding, a, a director and then chief uh, at Jack, Jackson Walker. Um, and uh, King and Spalding's a good, they're, they're actually not that different. And I, I maybe chalk it up to the fact that they're both Southern firms, you know, uh, one based in Texas, one based in Georgia. Um, and there's, you know, there's a certain camaraderie. There's a certain conge uh, 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 congeniality, congeniality, a uh, certain niceness <laughs> to, uh, to, to how they are uh, personality wise. Um, and so you know, and one of the things that at both places that that I've really uh, enjoyed is that I do, you know, I, I was a programmer. I, I did a lot of database administration, a lot of uh, programming um, and, and just kind of creative thinking about how do you take two or three disparate pieces of information and find a way to tie those together. And both, at, you know, King of Spalding, they really allowed me um, uh, reluctantly at first and then gladly uh, once once they figured out that I could I could do some stuff and take some stuff off the, the plates of, of some of the IT and the in the knowledge management folks um, and and so you know the whole idea was how how can I quickly gather information how can I do 
uh, analytics on the data that we have and how can I get that pushed out uh, to the right people at the right time so that they can make good decisions. And um, and so I've done that uh, both at King and & Spalding and, and at Jackson Walker, and I think it's it's worked out really well. When we come back, Greg explains why the law librarian stereotype that may come to mind is very outdated and how through the use of tech, analytics, and collaborations with other members of the law firm, knowledge services help contribute to the law firm's bottom line. This podcast is brought to you by Percipient a legal services company powered by technology. Percipient helps legal teams tackle legal operations, electronic document review, and process automation. Percipient services include managed document review, subpoena compliance, cyber incident response, and also helps legal teams provide clients with process-driven legal support. To learn more, visit percipient.co. Percipient. Legal services powered by technology. Before we get back to my talk with Greg, I want to encourage you to visit tlpodcast.com. There's an episode page for every episode of Technical Legal at tlpodcast.com. On those episode pages, you will find more information about our guests and links to some of the stuff we talk about. Also, if you want to subscribe to Technical Legal, you can find us on pretty much every major podcast platform. And while you're there, if you like us enough, I hope you give us a favorable review. If you want to get a hold of me, you can catch me on LinkedIn, on Twitter, or email me at cmain at percipient.co. That's C-M-A-I-N at percipient.co. All right, let's get back to my conversation with Greg Lambert. When we pick back up, Greg explains why creative persons are a great fit to fill the role of law librarians. And through this creativity, they can provide value to the firm and bust down stereotypes. Well, and, and I'm a big believer, you know, in the uh, Rahm Emanuel quote of, you know, never let a crisis go to waste. Um, and a lot of people forget about the second part of that quote, which is because there's lots of opportunity for people who are creative and approach with a, with a different uh, view on how to solve that problem, uh, you know, or handle that crisis. And that's kind of, you know, geez, I've been in, in the library world since 1994, which, you know, if you think back, 1994 is a probably about the time you get the, your yahoo.com email uh, address, <laughs> at least I did. And, uh, you know, so there's been this constant change in, and um, this transition away from the library as a space and the library more as a service. And I had to laugh because courts are going through the same deal right now. And I'm and I've made jokes about, you know, it's like if, if a judge wants to figure out how he can look at what he what he or she is doing as a service to the community, go talk to your law librarian, uh, because they've been doing this for 30 years almost. And uh, so it's it's one of the things that that we approach about. You know, we get tied up in titles. Uh, you know, it's America. We love our titles. And, you know, when it comes to librarian, a lot of people immediately have an idea of what that means. And, you know, and as, you know, as good looking as I am, when I take my glasses off and lower, my, you know, take my hair out of the bun and shake it, um, you know, there's a lot more than that. And, and so it's a constant, you know, you constantly got to uh, engage with the people that you're working with. Um, you've got to be seen as not just a, a expense and overhead, you've got to be seen as a way of, you know, you're there to help, uh, you know, make things more efficient. You, you really can be more on the revenue side. Um, and so it's, it's just, it's, but it's a constant, not battle, but it's, it's a constant mission that you have to you know, kind of prove your worth, show what you're doing, and and really just show that you belong in the room. So, you just mentioned the revenue piece. Like, give, expand on that. What? How are you helping the law firm's bottom line? Yeah. So, uh, one of the things that, it, and maybe people don't know this, but a lot, most of the librarians on the research side are billable, um, and. Not only are, are we billable and we can do, you know, you can look at a dollar amount that uh, that we make. Um, you can also look at the fact that, especially the way that we're set up, is that we also work on the business development side as well. We're, we're not in the foreground of that, but we're in the background of that. And, um, you know, we help with creating those pitches. We help with answering those RFPs. We help with doing the 
due diligence background, um, and both on obtaining new clients. We do due diligence on our lateral hires uh, that come in. Um, we do analytics on the work that we're taking on. Um, we There are a number of librarians that have gone over into the pricing uh, aspect of law firms and helping attorneys who get asked by their clients that says, okay, you're going to take this work. I need to know how much this work's going to going to cost me. And, you know, they don't expect it or they don't want to hear from that lawyer is like, oh, well, it depends, right? They want a number. And so there's a number of opportunities that librarians and, and legal information professionals have injected themselves into over, over the past number of years. And a lot of that is is revenue generating. And so it's, it's one of the things that, that I tell, especially newer librarians that are coming in, of you know how do I how do I uh, become important in my firm? And I was like, well, the first thing is figure out how to, how to get to the revenue, or you know at least project that you are helping on the revenue side and you're not just an expense. Now, why are you well suited to help out with the pricing? Like, if a lawyer comes to you and goes, "All right, I got a got a pitch. They want a budget. How do you help? And why are you well suited to do that?" Well, it, I think for a lot of us, it's we have the tools, we have the expertise, we have the analytical skills uh, to do that. It's there's a learning curve, obviously, for that. Um, but I've looked around and I've got a lot of people that you know were librarians because they needed uh, people that could do analytics. Uh, they needed people that could look at routines. They could look at numbers. They could look at phases of a of a legal uh, uh, matter, and could actually then write up a report that says, "Okay, here's you know in in phase one, we're looking at this. If we keep the scope at X, Y, and Z, you know, typically this is where this is where we land." Um, and so it's it's one of those things that we can we can take the disparate information and actually make it make sense. Um, and and hopefully, and one of the things I think librarians do very well is also they they can put that in plain English, um, and and you know because even if the even if your uh, inside uh, or your client may be a lawyer, um, they still want to be able to kind of read in plain plain English, um, and so that's that's one of the things that we we really work on. What are the tools you use and what's the, what are the technology that you use to, to put this information together and do this analysis? Well, it's, a, it's a hodgepodge. Uh, there are internal tools, obviously, uh, your, your accounting system. Um, you look at things like your, your DMS, your time, time and billing. Um, there's external tools out there. There's you know, pricing specific tools um, that, that you can use. The, they're are also uh, tools that you get from that are developed by Westlaw and Lexis, you know, Lex Machina, for example, um, that you can evaluate if if you're going before a certain judge or you're you're going against a certain law firm, um, you can kind of get an ex expectation of uh, are these people that you know just want to settle or are these people that want to go to trial? Um, is, is this a judge that is um, that will allow summary judgment, or is this a judge that you've got to get further in, into the matter uh, before she decides uh, what what it is that uh, you know if, if that's going to go to trial? You know, m most matters don't go to trial, so that's kind of the you know you draw that out, but you 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 work on it. Um, you know, I and I'm involved with uh, organizations. There's a legal value network, uh, which is fairly new. Um, that, that I work with, that you interviewed you know, a couple of the guys a few episodes ago. Yeah. Uh, okay. Keith yeah. Justin, uh, they're, yeah. Uh, you know, it's a great, uh, organization for people that are looking to go into that. That's, you know, if you're looking at pricing that I highly recommend it. You know, your example of Lex Machina is it just clicked with me. That's the perfect example of how someone with, with historically library skills can help with the revenue in the business because what is that? You're looking at court records and history and what a law firm has done. And it's the, it's the 2020 version of going to the library and, you know, compiling information about a, a judge's opinions or what have you. It's a perfect mm -hmm. example. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you think about it, a, a lot of it goes off of Pacer and who who was who were the Pacer gurus? The librarians were the Pacer gurus. Exactly. So, no, that's exactly right. You know, and 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 it's the same thing for for a number of of other tools. Is that uh, you know, if you think back to the '90s, the computer that was in the firm typically was in the library. Um, and so uh, I don't think it's as big. Uh, in, in fact, I've had a, a, an argument for a dozen years or so with a, uh, with a friend of mine, Scott Preston, who used to be the CIO at, at Fulbright. Um, and that was, uh, you know, the information technology guys stole the word information from us. And, <laughs> um, and, and it really kind of, I, I think, you know, he, he disagrees uh, with me, but I always say, well, you could have been, you know, uh, you know, the chief data officer instead of the chief information officer, um, because you're dealing with data. You're dealing with that. You're the librarians are dealing with the information. Um, and we, we would always have a fun little conversation going back and forth on that. That, that is not like that. I want to get back to your reference that article, um, a librarian or any other name, but I, I think this is the article. It talked about when the American Association of Law Libraries wanted to change their name to Association of Legal Information, there was uproar. I, I wanted to, I want to hear more about this. <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah, that was uh, something. If you ever, um, you, you know that uh, you've stepped in it when you get 80% of, of your association that chimes in. Um, it, 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 so, uh, and, and I think only, only be, it wasn't a, a hundred percent because there are just some people that, that couldn't remember what their password was to, uh, to go vote on that. Um, yeah, that was a, a, a few years ago. Luckily I wasn't really involved in coming up with the name, but there, there was this, uh, um, the American Association of Law Libraries, which I was president of a, a, a couple of years ago, um, wanted to change the name to, oh, what was it? It was um, Association for Legal Im Information, I think was was what it was. Um, and it got, you know, just got staunchly voted down. And a lot of it was because people really did not want to give up the libraries in the, the title uh, of the association because that's who, you know, that's who we are. Um, and and so I had, I had argued uh, back and forth very unsuccessfully uh, to to change the name because I thought it would give everyone it would it would shake up the association and it would shake up some of the professionals in in our industry to look at really the different things that we were doing that we weren't you know going to be pigeonholed into uh, you know, taking care of the books on a shelf, you know, on the top floor of a, you know, with a beautiful view out there that, you know, with the thought that this is where the, the attorneys are going to take their clients because it's so you know gorgeous. Um, but, you know, and, and as my uh, friend Toby Brown always says, it's like, you know, you're, you're arguing over the rules of a game that that's no longer even being played. So it's, uh, you know, I, I really thought it would give us a chance to look at things differently. Um, Obviously, it it wasn't the time. I did have someone a, a, a couple of years after that that came up to me at at a conference that said, you know, I was really adamant about not changing the name, but now that I'm you know, looking around, I think that was an opportunity that that we missed. Um, but I will tell you this: I I will never bring that up again because I took a sound beating uh, on it. So, um, uh, and and I think you know it's an individual. Uh, you can look at me and I'm, I'm very proud to be a, a law librarian. I will tell that, but that's not my title. Um, you know, it's, but it is what I, you know, it is what I am. Which is a good segue to the last question I want to ask, because I know we're, our time's running short here. What would you tell a person who's trying to either reconfigure their law library and their knowledge services, or maybe it's a firm that's growing and they need to add this they need to add the position or someone to be in charge of some a person, a point person to own this. What does the law library of 2020 need to have at a minimum? What do you suggest? Um, well, I, I would say this. Don't think that you have all the answers. Um, you, you are an expert at getting the information that the organization that you're working for, whether it's a, an academic, a court, a, a, a law firm um, at getting them what they need to practice law. 
or to do their daily job. And the only way you're going to know that is to engage with the people within your firm. And that's everybody. That's the newest associates that's coming in from, from law school that use, you know, some some creative tool that, that the law school was testing. Um, that goes to the most senior partner who understands that, yeah, the, uh, I, I'm a tax guy and I understand all this stuff is online, but it doesn't work for me to go online. And, you know, and, and I don't want to fight over that. Um, the other thing is to remember, um, and, and, and I want to say this in, in the right way, um, it's not your money. It's, you know, it's the partner's money. And there, sometimes it's, n you, you don't necessarily want to put, you know, die on, on the hill uh, for somebody that doesn't really care that they're spending more money in order to get what, what he or she wants. Um, and so you can't take it so personally that, you know, that you go, uh, um, and, and again, I, I think, uh, on, on the inside, sometimes when I lose those fights, I always go, well, you know, that doesn't really affect my pay at the end of the day, but it does affect theirs. And if they're willing to do that, then let, you know, I, I will give them all the information they need to make a, a, a good decision and understand what, what the costs are, um, all, all around. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's their money. Um, you know, and so that's, that's what I would say is, you know, you, you are there to help guide and give your, uh, professional opinion and, you know, really kind of do your best. And, but at the same time, remember that, um, this is somebody else's firm and there are times where it doesn't matter if it, doesn't seem like a great decision to you. It's, it, you know, at the end of the day, it's not your decision. Well, Greg, great. This has been a great conversation. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. If people want to find you, where should they go? My email is is really easy. It's uh, uh, glambert, so G Lambert at uh, jw.com, or uh, you can go to uh, Three Geeks in a Law Blog, uh, which is geeklawblog.com, which also uh, is where we host the uh, podcast, The Geek in Review. So any of those, and, and feel free to reach out to me. Or I guess Glambert on, on Twitter as well. <laughs> and as I mentioned, I'll put links to all this stuff on the awesome. episode page. Awesome. Well, it was great talking with you, Chad. Appreciate it. That's a wrap. As always, we appreciate you listening to Technically Legal, and we appreciate your support throughout the years. If you want to subscribe, you can catch us on most major podcast platforms. And while you're there, if you like us, I hope you leave us a favorable review. Until next time, this has been Technically Legal.